Okay. Um, first, I uh, want to thank the organizer for inviting me here. And uh, some of you talk, uh, heard my talk before. So uh, I, because of that, I, I make sure I add a few slides that are different at the end, but uh, most of them will be the same. Uh, uh, like Shanghui comment, this is the most fun conference. And when I got fun and I asked a lot of questions, now it's your turn because I let just say that uh, what I talk, you can completely say this is a bogus. I don't believe it. Okay. Um, uh, and in fact, uh, I put even a more outrageous uh, quote here. This might be what I might be talking is the quantum evaporation process. But it's not, let's say, Casimir, not near field. It's, uh, it certainly has fluctuating. It certainly has electrical dynamics. And I think it's a surface process. So uh, 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 I'm all uh, at the end hoping uh, really have some uh, good questions and good discussion because I don't understand myself. Uh, but say, let me, let me uh, acknowledge the really uh, experiment uh, done by Dr. Yao Dong too, most of those. and. Uh, uh, we, in fact, uh, we couldn't publish our papers because nobody believed us. So I put them on, uh, uh, say, archive when you can look at them. And uh, so let me just say a phenomenon we all know, evaporation. And if we think about that in terms of evaporation needed energy, I think it's fair to say the only thing we know is the thermal energy, right? If you want to evaporate water, even you use electricity, you heat it up, you evaporate water. And uh, uh, so that's, that's what we know. We need thermal energy. In fact, to evaporate water, we need a lot of thermal energy because the Latin heat of water uh, is really large. And the, uh, even the specific heat of water uh, is very large. So that's a very energy uh, intensive process. And uh, um, it's a daily experience when we look at the clouds. Every time I go to sunset, I look at, say, the, uh, the beautiful color. I'll show one later on. And I'm thinking what I talk next will be related to all this. And uh, the other fact I want to show is that water pretty much does not absorb visible sunlight. Right? So this is the solar spectrum, green, and here is calculated based on the absorption coefficient of water, and it can propagate at least in clear water 40 meters. Right? So basically it doesn't absorb. And uh, uh, so uh, to evaporate the water, right, we if I want to use the sunlight you have water, so first step is to try to heat it up. So in the past, people have done putting nanoparticles in the water. They say there's plasmonic, water is cold. Well, the, around the individual nanoparticle uh, gets so hot and there are bubbles generated. And we look into that. Uh, we don't think that's a process. So we actually uh, uh, develop a simpler way we say rather than putting nanoparticle in water, uh, let's flow something on surface so we don't disperse this into volume. And uh, so it's basically black graphite with uh, also an insulating layer so that the heat absorbed doesn't conduct to water and uh, we can get the surface pretty hot and evaporate the thermally. That's the original of what we thought is a thermal evaporation. And uh, this is an approach that a lot of people took Copy a lot of papers, and uh, uh, you, you can go look into this uh, area. There are really a lot of papers. But this is a number to remember. It's a simple calculation. One hour, how much water it can evaporate. If we, I put the sunlight, standard sunlight is 1,000 watt per meter square. One hour, how much energy it has. And now the Latin heat of water, and now sensible heat of water, and I assume all the energy goes to evaporate water. And that's the maximum you have, 1.4 or 1.5. OK, so that's the number. And uh, this is a surprise. Um, uh, in uh, 2018, uh, Gui Hua Yi's group from UT Austin, they put a hydrogel 
on water surface as pearls. So it's follow basic strategy we developed. But they found something that really surprised them. Their evaporating rate is about three. Twice of the thermal evaporation rate, right? And their efficiency calculation is wrong, I think. But say, uh, you look at the evaporation rate, that's uh, say what's happening. And uh, uh, they interpret that they say, okay, water inside hydrogel is different. Uh, you got the water bound to the molecule, you got the water far away, you got something intermediate, and they say there's a reduced latent heat. And the uh, water has a lot of cluster, so all those were thrown there. The basic idea is uh, the state of water change inside hydrogel, which we tried, we tested, and uh, we don't think that's the case. And uh, so, um, when we tried it, it turns out it's not easy. It actually took us, uh, so when I uh, hear uh, Zheng Yi's talk, I say they have done a lot on this and uh, they achieved a, a pretty high uh, evaporation rate. But it took us a year to repeat their experiment. In fact, I sent my guys to Gui Hua's group and uh, basically uh, their experiment was right. So we repeated it, we made the material, it took us some time. And uh, then we spend a lot of time trying to understand what's going on. And we struggle quite a lot in understand because we, we didn't, uh, we try to see whether it's uh, the thermal evaporation and then I then we're not convinced. And meanwhile, there are a lot of groups. Uh, you just heard a few days ago from uh, uh, Yijian and let's say here I cite uh, Beyond the, what the Gui Hua Yu, they did, they use, say, there are a lot of different materials were shown to have the super, super thermal evaporation rate. Uh, using different absorber, polypyrrole, titanium dioxide, graphene oxide, carbon black, and using different uh, host material polymers. And uh, I hear is uh, at least uh, mentioned three different materials, including Cattle manure, right? So, so it will work, carbonized. So you, so in that case, you can carbonize fruits, you know, so all different materials seem to get this super thermal evaporation. Where is that energy coming from? Right? Not zero point energy, okay? And, uh, uh, so, um, you can say, uh, this is the Gui Hua's group, the, the report, and people report as high as, uh, I said that the limit is a 1.5, and now if you have seven, and the uh, E reported five, right? So you got a four or five times lower, if it's latent heat, the four or five times lower latent heat of liquid water. Can you believe is that happening? So we, we actually tried, we tried to heat it up electrically, it didn't work, so, so it's not the thermal Latin heat reduction. So what's the mechanism, right? And uh, uh, so I read all this, we did a lot of uh, scratching head, did a lot of testing. And then one day last year I was thinking, what's common among all this? And uh, I realized that the only thing common is the increase of area, right? So all porous material. And uh, when we have a increase of surface area, so you, it could be a surface effect. And what is that surface effect, right? And so that's what uh, led me to say, oh, is this something like a photoelectric effect? It's not a thermal evaporation. And somehow photon can directly evaporate water without going through thermal process, right? And uh, of course, you see that's crazy because water doesn't absorb, right? And we know that already. And so why it doesn't absorb? The other is energy doesn't match, right? Water, water bonds, hydrogen bond, and it's very well alone, that's a 0.26 EV, while green light is a 2.5 EV. So energy doesn't match. But I did a reading and realized that in water field, which people say is the most complex liquid, and it's a hydrogen bound electrode. So in a way, 
So in liquid, the water are bonded almost like a molecule, hydrogen bond, which is weaker than covalent, but it's 10 times higher than Kt, because 0.26, well, Kt is 0.026. So if we cleave off, if a photon cleave out a cluster of water of this hydrogen bonded, and you can think about at least from energy conservation perspective, that's not a, a very. So uh, with that, I say, okay, in the past, the experiment that was always done by putting black absorber into the material. Hydrogel typically itself, polymer do not absorb invisible. So I said, can I do an experiment to show if I put, do not put absorber, will I make a water absorb? Water plus pure hydrogel. Neither of them absorb. Now I put them together. Do they absorb or not? No chemical reaction. So this was the first experiment after many years struggle and we did this. And here you can see this is a polyvinyl alcohol powder, dry powder. You gel it. it. So we measure reflection transmission, we subtract out. And this are like a few percent, two or three percent. That's the experimental error because when you do this, subtracting two, uh, transmission reflection, right? So water, pure water is all there, so they do not absorb in the uh, green region. But when you put a little bit of water into, so this is a fully gelated, so this is, this is as gelated PVA, so full of water doesn't absorb. But you dry it up, you put a little water, so there, in that case, a lot of surface area, and it's not absorbed. Right? So this is a 60% weight water, 50%, 30%. This is a, a, a fully swollen. And uh, uh, it turns out also just during freeze thaw, it just freezes, thaw it, it starts absorbed. No chemical reaction. And so that was the first time now it looks like we're on right track. Somehow photon can directly get absorbed at the water surface. And uh, we do evaporation, and in fact, uh, some of the experiment we had, uh, uh, say, for several years, but now we put a pure PVA, and we do evaporation. It, it looks like there are two stages, right? First stage is the water cap the whole surface, and you do not see anything special. The evaporation rate is no. But once the water recess into the surface, you've got a surface area exposed, and you got a lot of surface area, so the evaporation rate goes significantly faster. And uh, so if we do the evaporation rate, here is the thermal limit. So even without absorber, in that case, we have to normalize. This is the yellow is actually measured because the absorptance that we measured. And uh, so normalize, you get beyond the thermal evaporation limit, right? So that's uh, uh, another sign. And uh, uh, actually, what really got us into this is a few years ago, we did the first experiment on wavelength dependence. We measure, we use the LED. People use a solar simulator, which is a broadband. So we bought the LED and put it into LED. We found this when, uh, at that time, is a polyvinyl alcohol plus polypyrrole. Polypyrrole is absorbing, but you can say it evaporates most at the green light. A green is water is least absorbing. So that was several years ago. And last year, once we have this, we went to test this pure polyvinyl alcohol hydrogel. It also is high side green, right? This is at the wavelengths, water is least absorbing. And uh, so that's the, so from, we have absorption measurement, we have evaporation measurement, anything in the vapor phase. So this is a vapor phase, we, we did a uh, temperature measurement distribution. So this is a, just above a pure water, you heat it up, you measure the temperature as a, away from distance, and that decays as expected, pretty much a continuous decay. But when you have hydrogel, this is a pure hydrogel, low absorber. You see, 
a major flat region in temperature. And in fact, we also have uh, other flat regions. So this is a typical. And the interpretation we have now is a, a photon come in a surface, it cleave off a cluster of molecules. So it doesn't just cleave off one water molecule because like I said, energy conservation, right? I need uh, say 2.5 EV. So cluster molecule and they break up in air, they saturate the air. So they, in that case, the temperature becomes flat because condensation and re-evaporation cancel each other. So you got a flat temperature region, and then with more air drawing, it starts to decrease again. So uh, what about the, the spectral, right? You do this, you see the spectroscopy. Spectroscopy, uh, spectroscopy people want to say, do you see signature in the spectrum? So here is the spectrum. This is a pure water evaporation. And this is a um, uh, pure PVA. And you can see there are some spectrum. We, this is a very complex. Explaining cluster spectrum is a very complex, uh, uh, very difficult. But at least we see the uh, signature different from the vapor phase on pure water and on hydrogel heated, uh, sort of, let's say, the LED heated surface. And so, uh, so that seems to be we're on the right track, right? What's a physical picture, right? What's the driving force? Okay, so here is, a, here is the, where the nano come in, even though we experiment there is a centimeter big, big uh, say container, right? So here's what I was thinking what's happening, right? You got a hydrogen network and that the interface of water is a fuzzy. It's never a sharp su surface. And uh, that transition region, people done molecular dynamic simulation is a few Armstrong, three to five to seven Armstrong range. So I put a 10 Armstrong. And then you look at the Maxwell equation, you say, okay, the uh, perpendicular displacement is continuous. So that means that there is a, a electric field difference between the vapor and the liquid side. And that's a factor of two because the dielectric constant is 1.3. You square it, and uh, so it's a factor of two difference. So over this few Armstrong, you get a, a huge electric field gradient. Now, water molecule is polar, so at the positive or negative charge of the atoms, the force is different. So that's a qualitative hand waving picture. It's a quadrupole force. It's not a dipole. You you expand the dipole in the quadrupole, and that, that's the where the force term come from. I'll, I'll show some model in there. So that was hydrogel. It was hard to quantify because hydrogel is a lot of random surface. And uh, so I was get curious. I say, can we be more quantitative? Can we observe this at a single interface? And uh, I was just uh, say telling my students trying, let's give a try. I didn't expect that we see anything special because a single interface I expect is very weak. So this is a, this is a glass holder. You just put the water, pure water. We got to go say uh, as pure as we could get. And then we put the LED or laser shine onto the surface. And in this case, I had an estimation at the beginning. I say, okay, electric field component is sine, uh, say sine theta, so square, sine theta square, and area projection is cosine. So if you do sine theta square cosine, I said put a 55 degree. So before we did the experiment, night perpendicular, and not, nothing happened. And this time I said, why don't you tilt LED to 55 degree? And uh, this is what he said, he saw. This is not 55, turns out 30 degree is best. That's another big puzzle we had. So this is just evaporation. So it's balanced, right? So you measure as a function of time, you put a bucket of water there, and then you measure function of time. So it's a simple experiment. So here is a lateral evaporation A and B. This is a green light, 520, where water can propagate 30 meters. 
and you turn on the light, the weight drop. Very big. And that was just uh, amazing, right? And uh, you take the slope, it gradually become parallel to lateral evaporation again. You turn off the light, the weight go back. I'm using light to lift off the weight of water and drop it back into the bucket. We call this a photolavitation. It's just a strange, right? What's going on, right? And so that was the first time. I was really surprised when I saw this. And it goes to wavelengths, right? Here, I, I mentioned hydrogel. We see peak at the 520. We see peak at 520 again. We have discrete, only discrete wavelengths, so we don't have the full spectrum. We don't know exactly where is the peak, but around the green, right? And the, in fact, the Yokita water is weaker. And beyond this, it's just like you got a threshold wavelength, just like a photoelectric effect. And so wavelength dependence. Angle, this is what I said at the beginning. I told my post, Yaodong, I said, do 55 degree. And what he saw, the peak happens around 30 degree. 30 to 40 degree. And that was a big puzzle for me for a long time. Uh, I'll, I'll show why later on, I think. This is another one. This was actually using laser rather than LED because we want to measure polarization. I think if my picture is right, we should only see in TM. We don't see in TE. And that's what we saw there, right? TE doesn't have an effect, and TM evaporate. And uh, so again, we went to look at spectrum. These are the two experiments. This is the calculation. Uh, transmittance of vapor, right? And uh, this is now light. You look at the scale, there's very little change, right? So this is 995. So it's pretty much in, uh, in our experimental laws. But uh, you do see sort of three of calculated ones actually larger. We, don't, we can't quite explain all this, but you do see three here. Because in air, you got the CO2, you got H2O that has the vibration overlap spectrum. So that's now LED. But when we turn on the LED, you can see the significant difference. In this case, it's a pure water surface evaporating from pure water surface, right? This is a, like a deep go to point A5. This is a 99%. So we saw all the signatures and needs are very different from single molecule vapor. And temperature distribution, this is even broader. Flat region, we saw, I explained before, you got a cluster break up. So you can see the actual when light shines on it, it cools down the air. You cool down with light, and then you got a flat temperature region. And uh, so after this, I said, okay, this seems to be really, it should happen everywhere. And in fact, I was taking a walk with my wife, and she said, oh, the weatherman said, when the sun burned, they fog. I said, okay, let's do a fog experiment, right? Because uh, the sun burned the fog is a thermal, normally we think. And that should not, the green light should not burn. Does the green light burn the fog? So here is the uh, experiment we did. We generated the water droplets in a box. So that's our fog chamber, and the clear, and after you put the fog there, and they shine different wavelengths again. This is temperature rise. Green night, you have highest temperature rise. So basically, we are seeing completely opposite than bulk absorption phenomena, because the green is least absorbing. So the Picture again is what I was showing, and this is actually this puzzle here. I said a really puzzle. So it turns out that you can also measure temperature. So this is the surface temperature of water. First, the A and the B cool down, and uh, and then say uh, some once it cool down to bottom, you got a flat. When you turn on light at the B, 
the temperature actually starts to increase a little bit. Initially, the evaporation rate highs, but then the evaporation rate decreases. So our interpretation is light cleave off the cluster, cluster accumulated on the surface region, and now the further accumulation, the, light, the cluster actually reflect back and jet recondense generate heat. So this is the temperature rise. And then eventually C and D, because of the further diffusion of the cluster is determined by single molecule diffusion to the environment. Because surface is cold, there's no convection in this case. And because of that, when we turn off the light, the cluster just recondense back. There are a lot of accumulation near the surface region, and the weight actually increase. And in this case, you see there is actually a small temperature spike because of that recondensation. So everything is a, uh, qualitatively, as we can explain. And uh, so we also, I talked to uh, some people like uh, uh, Ron Shen from Berkeley because he did a lot of nonlinear spectroscopy of water at the surface. He said you have to measure absorption. Uh, we infer the absorptance based on that temperature, energy balance, that's a very large value. I think there are some uh, uh, error with that model I, I, I can uh, explain uh, uh, in privately. But here is a measure. So this measurement using lasers uh, and the TM, you can say, is similar to the evaporation, similar to the temperature rise. And you don't see that in TE mode. So this is all consistent. And based on this measure absorptance, and based on the evaporation rate, we, we estimate this one photon actually can lock out over 200 molecules. This is a 40 to 50 times more efficient than thermal evaporation. Because of the cluster, you don't need to break all the bonds. Right? So that's the experiment. And uh, I've been struck. I, I wrote some modeling. I did. I, because this turns out that I have to go back to the photo or the old work on photoelectric effect and see whether we can draw any inspiration from the modeling side. And uh, I wrote something about this. I was actually talking to a lot of people here. I, and I want to share with you just this, is, this again could be very, I would say it's a time weaving. But uh, one puzzle I have since last year, because I told my student, try 55 degree, right? And he, he said, measure the 30 degree. So that was a big puzzle for me. So here is my simple model. We have a dipole. So I treat the dipole water network as a big dipole. At the interface, there is an electric field gradient coming in, right? And there is electric field coming in. So I expand the dipole Hamiltonian uh, in the just uh, the positive negative charge, classical expansion, not a quantum, uh, say, uh, vector uh, potential expansion, right? And then you got the dipole contribution, you got the quadruple expansion. And the dipole, there is no energy match. The dipole vibration electronic doesn't match the photon energy. So when I calculate the, the Fermi golden rule calculation, this term will drop out. So what I need to evaluate is this quadruple term. And quadruple term, if I go calculate the uh, see scatter matrix, again, uh, I'm treating more like a, I, I read some uh, say, uh, paper say, OK, for those, you can, even though it's a, so you should do vector potential, all this expansion. This is a classical, almost classical, but cast in quantum form because of the one photon process, whether you do the field of vector potential doesn't make a difference. So the point is, before I was just thinking about sine theta, cosine theta square, but now I have two vector product. One is the gradient mu times uh, the dipole moment times the electric field, and D is also the same dipole moment direction. So I actually get a square. That was what I was missing before. So once I have this, my picture is uh, the 
we got the molecule to the continuum state exact cleavage bonds. Right, this bonds is the surrounding. And then we do a, a, say, a, a Fermi Golden Rule calculation, and uh, I don't have a self consistent electric field potential at the interface. I just put a linear profile, and that's the absorptance I got. And here is the angle, and I list with this theta minus alpha. R, theta is the angle of incidence, alpha is the dipole angle. Depends on dipole angle, I can switch this to around 30 degree. Uh, and that's the, what we saw experiment. Of course, the curve is different because I think I haven't done the average as a musical average. I, I think that's the reason. And uh, I estimate this, it's uh, somewhere the order macula is 10 to the minus 4 to 10 to the minus 2. Because you see I got the d force power, that's the dipole separate, positive negative charge separation. And it depends on the cluster side. So it's a, it's a range. I think I can come up to the right range and uh, right order. And uh, uh, so this does seem to be a quantum process. And let me just, uh, uh, and I'm, I'm going to wrap this up quickly. This, because yesterday, Karsten talked about the boundary condition. I was looking to the boundary condition, uh, how I can modify, calculate this, because the surface process. Right, how I can incorporate into when I want to model clouds, right? So the inspiration was the past work on the photoelectric effect, surface photoelectric effect, where it was found that the electrons spill over to the vacuum side. So it's not a, a sharp surface at the metal. It's a fuzzy surface electron, one to two Armstrong fuzziness, right? And they, uh, that was uh, uh, the uh, one uh, established approach is uh, Faberman. I introduced a Faberman parameter where this is a really the, uh, the perpendicular, uh, uh, say, Faberman parameter is a measure of the charge deviation from the interface. And the parallel parameter is a measure of the current deviation. So with that, you can describe the, uh, the uh, interface reflectance. And in fact, uh, uh, MIT Marin Soyachik's group recently generalized this. Uh, and they have very complex derivation, which I, I had trouble go through by myself. But basically, say, this is the class where Maxwell equation. This is the, if you include the FIBAM parameter, you modify the Maxwell boundary condition. I had a little trouble going through their derivation, and so I went to through uh, my own, and that was, a, I wanted to show you, and this is the basic idea, it's very simple, right? You start from Maxwell equation, you integrate it over the surface region, and this is, for example, I take a Gauss law, and I have my TM wave incident, and I integrate, I take a limit, because I want the boundary to be zero thickness, so I can just apply it to the boundary, and I gather the Maxwell equation. So basically, this one doesn't rely on any model. As long as you think the field has a, has a variation, it's not just a sharp champ at the interface, then you modify the Maxwell equation, and then you can, you can basically derive all this. Uh, I, I, I've gone through the math, so you derive the area of this equation. And with that, you can calculate the absorptance uh, at the interface. I'm still struggling with those expressions, but, the, but I think the, uh, this is the way that we're going. So let me just wrap up. I think there, like I said, at the beginning, you don't need to believe me. This is what we say. We, I don't know what's going on. I have a hypothesis, and uh, I think I can explain the experiment. And, uh, but say, it's just surprising, because this, this should happen every day, and we don't know it. And so, uh, uh, is this effect happening widely? Clock, clouds, ocean, soil, right? There's no reason it doesn't if, if we're right, right? We have the data on fog, and uh, uh, this could change the climate model because the solar, uh, how much is absorbed. And uh, why the peak happen at five? I have no idea. This is the water least absorbing. 
what happened there, right? And uh, does this happen in other liquids? We have tested. We have tested a few other liquids, and it does. We test a polar liquid. It seems non-polar doesn't happen. Does it happen in ice? So we had a discussion, so probably the paper on water on ice. So we actually did the experiment in cold Boston weather during the night, my postdoc, and then we saw that there's no water on the surface, so we saw some effects. So in my, we don't know, maybe there's water when the ambient is negative 10 degree. And uh, uh, so how we quantitatively characterize, how we model, I gave a very, very kind waving. So the model, right, is this a really quantum process, right? The wavelength dependence, it seems yes, right? Angle, you could use a classical, but wavelength seems yes. And uh, how one photon can cleave 200 molecules? I don't know. I'm, right? I just think this is a one molecule and bond with the surrounding with that 2.5 Armstrong, a uh, 2.5 EVA. Right? Could this be due to a surface pro instability? Right? In fact, uh, we do see instability sometimes. You can avoid that, but also it happens in hydrogel. There is a very different surface characteristics. Right? So I, I think uh, this is a, uh, not a cause. It's a, it might be a consequence. And uh, finally, I was ask, actually asking adjacent program. I said, why the leaves are green? Why the leaves avoided the solar radiation where the peak happens at 520? Is it because this is evaporating too much water? I don't know. It's just a couldn't. To immediately just to say, this might be an interesting hypothesis. This might have something to do, right? So with that, I, I, I think I just told you something very puzzling. And uh, we don't quite understand it, but we observe it. And we have a hypothesis. So, uh, and uh, we have some preliminary model, but uh, I think this model and the picture it's all subject to question. It's the data that we need to have a good interpretation, right? And with that, uh, let me thank all the people. And uh, this was uh, from the beach. So every time when I look at clouds, sunset, and in fact, you look, it's the opposite of sunset that's, that's red, right? It's not like the look at sun that's red. So all this I say, is there anything related to the photomolecular effect because the green light is absorbed? Of course, we know the sky is blue because the scattering, and the, the, it's red because the blue star is scattered. But the, you look at the clouds, sunset, you look at all that red, just can't say, for me, it's just I can't stop asking, is there because some of the green light is further absorbed, right? And I had a lot of fun here discussing with people. I'm writing this quantum form and, and ask people, did I write it right? Because I'm not familiar in writing this bracket format. So for people here, um, please, yeah, through a question and uh, help me formulate it. Thank you. So questions from here. Thank you very much, Gang, for giving us kind of a perspective talk as well. Um, I, you, your perspective reminds me very much of uh, some work in the 1980s by a group of Italian particle physicists that looked at uh, kind of spontaneous symmetry breaking in water. So if you treat water as uh, a couple of uh, rotors, essentially just dipole rotors, and you induce uh, an asymmetry in your system, either with an electric field or, uh, you know, like a water-air interface, you can essentially induce a mean field description of your dynamics that creates a polarization. This is a low energy, like a Nambu Goldstone type mode. So this is kind of like, they called it dipolar waves. They were, you know, well described in kind of the field theoretic or mean field theoretic formula, formulation. And so they, they came to similar conclusions about 
the collective interactions of thousands or tens of thousands of water molecules over a micron cubed of volume, right, in the infrared. So uh, I'm curious if uh, you've, you've connected to that work at all and if, uh, I mean, because what you're observing is very similar to, so they were able to reproduce the spectra, the main peaks of the spectra of uh, liquid water, which is distinct, of course, from the spectra of a single water molecule. And so those peaks don't show up in a single water molecule, right. but they do in the broad, broad spectrum of liquid water. So um, I'm, I'm curious if you've connected to that work and then if you can comment on the differences in uh, the spectra and, and we can talk more yeah. about details. Oh, that's great. I actually don't know that work. So I would love to know more about, because I was a puzzle of the how I was searching literature, anybody actually model the absorption in pure water because I couldn't find them. So uh, uh, yeah, I'll find out from you those paper of eager yeah. to look into this. Sure. Uh, yeah, so this is where I have no idea. In fact, I was talking to John Pendry and his first uh, immediate response was maybe it's a surface wave. Uh, I, I, I think, say, what that we, like I said, we see the surface wave, right, surface tension, but say, I think it's because our LED actually is because we come is a divergent beam, it's not a parallel beam when come. So surface is not uniform. And then some region actually generate the recondense more differently. So there's a, some temperature different that actually probably the reason behind the surface wave. I don't think it's the cause. But how the surface tension uh, will change, those are the all open question. We were testing, for example, uh, uh, liquid with ions, say liquid with surfactant. And uh, right now we have no, no model. Right. I'm gonna say what I wrote down is uh, uh, that last few slides. The model is uh, I just uh, put what I have. That's all we have so far. In the in the manual equations you can see in your model, you have you have introduced these quantities as both sides of the surface, but not uh, as on the surface. So it is uh, D plus D minus, but not the S. So how, how do so you this uh, this is uh, this is the this was an, this was an, not my creation. This was actually from Fieberman to Marin, Soyachik. They write those, and they have, a, they are more really based on derivation of a surface plasma type. But the, what I'm showing is that it happens, it seems as long as you have the transition of, a, because in the Maxwell equation, we have a discontinuity, right? So as long as you get rid of that discontinuity, you say, okay, I got a certain thickness. Then I will derive this parameter, right? Basically, I can do my math, and this is a, because I want the thickness of zero, so I can apply the boundary condition. And uh, that's what I'll have. I have this term, and this term is uh, the parallel parameter. So how to model that, right? For the electron, Faberman has done that, and uh, model non-local, they use non-local. Basically, you combine DFD calculation with a non-local Maxwell equation, and then you find out self-consistently the local electric field, right? I don't know how to do that for dipole yet, permanent dipole, right? So I was talking to some people, I say, I'm desperate to find how I can model non-local dielectric constant at the interface. Well, there are theory, but for uh, when the surface is an acidic material, System, uh, if they introduce a uh, quantities of, uh, related to the surface, so you divide the system in three parts. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I look at, so those, they're, 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 those were models before Fieberman. Yeah. So you could see Ausband, they have, you got to introduce a surface layer. And my understanding, that's not the best approach. Mm -hmm. This is a better approach. That's, a, that's at least based on my reading there. Yeah, you, you, you can do an anisotropic layer at the interface. And uh, um, um, of course, even there, you have still have to see what's your property of that layer, right?
Am I using the phone? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, yeah. Um, just a quick question to confirm the number. So the absorption that you measure at a single interface is 6%. No, well, here, well, that's the first uh, is estimation. That's based on temperature energy balance estimation. And the reason it's not accurate is because uh, we neglect this layer where the molecule break up and they can extract energy from the surrounding. So this was not, this was the estimation. This was more the direct measurement, the measure reflection transmission. And the shape is the same, but the number here is a, is a half of that. That's I see, so That's it's about three to 4%. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. this can be attributed entirely from the interface inter experimentally. I think so. Uh, you, uh, okay, here is a TE mode, right? TE mm -hmm. mode, Suppose a lot to absorb much because of the, right. But we see a little bit of uh, increase. I think that, that probably is because of the increase of beam length as you do the angle. But see, uh, you could also say, okay, if T doesn't absorb, this is my experimental uncertainty, mm -hmm. right? So, so basically, I'm still about the 3%. Okay. Yeah. Are there no vapor on top of the surface that we could get enhanced scattering, for example? Uh, the, when you got the, this uh, sort of cluster region, I think we actually measure smaller reflectance. I think there is a gradient effect, okay. right? Uh, um, but this is a absorption measurement that's one minus transmission minus reflection. Right, right. so this is a one minus, and this is a T and TM are done same. Same okay. way, right? So you clearly you see the difference. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Um, thank you very much. I mean, I, I must say that this is really puzzling, and I'm trying to understand a bit the the, the effect itself. So um, I was trying to reformulate this in my words. Uh, can I see this a kind of surface-induced catalysis of uh, 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 water so that uh, the surface is enhancing the process that you have here? And uh, a bit like uh, what, uh, what you have in SERS in a completely different frequency range, but what you have there in surface enhanced Rama spectroscopy or scattering, so you have that the surface is enhancing the process because of the near field. So here, as far as I understood, you have that the, the process is accelerated with respect to what you were expecting by the presence of the surface. I, 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 am I correct? I do, did I understand correctly what, what you were saying? So first, uh, when you mention catalysis, I want to bring up the work of Zaris from Stanford Chemistry. And that they actually found that, that the water droplets, when you got a lot of surface, uh, they can produce hydrogen peroxide without a catalyst. So that was a, sort of was a difficult chemical reaction, but they claim they have measured more uh, for hydrogen peroxide than, than, than normal, uh, say, without the catalysis. So, so that was a puzzle. I was thinking whether there are connection between this. I don't know. But say, regarding the search, I, I don't think it's the same because right now I don't have any mechanism to interact, right? So, so there's no vibrational match, energy match. There's no electronic energy match. So, I'm saying this is like a desorption process, a photon directly excites the molecule, breaking the bonds. So that's the picture I, 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 I use. Yeah, but, 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 but I, don't, I don't know whether. I, mean, I was not saying that it was the same as SIRS, but I was thinking that as in SIRS, the surface enhanced the, 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 the effect. So I was yeah. understanding. On, on that, I, I, I agree. In fact, uh, I was reading. It, the source of my inspiration come from the past work of photoelectric, surface photoelectric effect. So in that case, they, they develop uh, all the tools. Uh, nobody deal with this term. That is still a single electron, sort of the, you can do e, uh, say, mu, the first term uh, will work. So here, what I think is the second term is the cutable term. 
uh, expansion of the dipole into the quadrupole. So that's where I think is the is the driving force. Uh, I don't know. That's a, that's a, that's, a, that's a where I am. All right. Thank you. So I, I think I can help you with the energy match um, in this theory that I mentioned. But can you go back to your previous slide on the 220? OK. So how am I to understand the 220 molecules per photon? Are you, because you have in, in 532 nanometers, you've got tens I got of the thousands. I got the evaporation rate, uh -huh. right? And I got the photon power coming in based on, based on absorption I measure. So I, I know the photon rate coming in, and now the molecule rate going out. So I divide the two, I get the per photon, right? It might not be this process uh -huh. because I don't know whether it's a two photon or it's a, it's not a single quantum process. It's just a based on the, I may measure the absorptance. And this is the number of molecules being evaporated? Yeah, I have okay. the evaporation rate, right? I, I, I do the evaporation rate, right, this one. I can take that evaporation rate, I divide it by the absorptance and the okay. photon flux rate, and I get a per photon equivalent. And what is that in energy, in EV, the, the, if you? This one? Yeah, the, the two. amount of two, for, to evaporate 220 molecules? Oh, uh, you, uh, so if you, count, if you count the hydrogen bond between, uh, each molecule has a, a two hydrogen bond, uh -huh. So that's a 0 0.26 times 200 times okay. 2. Okay. So that's much bigger. Yeah. So yeah. I'm cleaving this bonded molecule with the rest of the water. That total bond may not be the hydrogen. It uh -huh. could be just one of our. One of our is a 0 0.1, uh, 0 0.013. Uh -huh. So two order magnitude, uh, yeah. one order magnitude smaller than hydrogen, right? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, uh, some people I was discussing, some people, oh, just use the Casimir force of peeling, right? You can think about also peeling process. You peel the layer. So what, what's mind boggling if this picture is how this photon, one photon, can break a several hundred bonding point? Yeah. I have, I just don't have a good, good way to, to describe that. Yeah. Right? It, Okay, I'm sorry, but we need to move to the next uh, talk. Thank you. Thanks, ladies and gentlemen.